Good morning. What a great crowd. We're so glad that each and every one of you are here today. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know you're our honored guest. We're glad that you're here. Continue to come back and be with us. A lot of things are going on at Southgate right now, and I want to mention just a couple of them that are coming up in the next uh, few weeks that are important to us. Uh, this coming Saturday, we're going to have the back-to-school giveaway that's going on in conjunction with a number of other area congregations. Uh, I want to encourage you to check your email on that. If you want to volunteer with it, you'll have an opportunity to do that. A link will be sent where you can sign up. Uh, there's going to be a volunteer meeting at the Carmack Boulevard Church of Christ this Thursday at 6 o'clock that will go through the details of what's going on. I believe you can also, you'll also be able to join that on Zoom if you want to. Uh, but we're going to be at the Central High School giving out. They're hoping we're going to give out about 2,500 backpacks in Murray County and in Hickman County on this Saturday. Uh, they're also the goal is to have $10,000 worth of gift cards to help kids get shoes. Uh, so they're going to be giving out a number of gift cards, giving out school supplies. It's a great opportunity uh, to help our community, to let them know uh, that they're important to us. And if you can help in that in any way, uh, I want to encourage you to do that. Also coming up, I believe we had a slide up earlier this morning about our ladies program. Uh, if you're new to Southgate or you haven't been here, I'll go ahead and tell you one of the greatest things that goes on at Southgate is our ladies program. Our ladies uh, do so much good in this community, and they're going to have a kickoff for sort of the year and what they're planning on doing here in a couple weeks on August the 9th. So I want to encourage the ladies to look at that. There will be information emailed out about that evening as well. It's going to be a special time, get together, have a meal, and talk about all the various things that our ladies do uh, to help this congregation be all that it can be. Another one I want to mention is Kyle Butt's going to be starting a, uh, a series on Wednesday nights in August. As school starts up, a lot of our kids go back to public schools, and you hear a lot of different things in the public schools that aren't always going to be in sync with what God's Word says, especially when it comes to evolution and the idea of God and creation. Well, Kyle is going to be speaking in August. Uh, talking about a number of topics that will help us as we uh, are confronted with a lot of information. Also help us as parents, help us as friends. If you have friends have questions about scientific things, about evolution, dinosaurs, the age of the earth, uh, August is going to be a great time to be at Southgate on Wednesday night. I think that can be a great opportunity to invite somebody else. Uh, if they have questions, you have a co-worker that's been wondering about things, Kyle's going to do a wonderful job with that. And we want to encourage you to promote that as well. And the final thing I've got is Johnson Ramsey is speaking tonight. Our, uh, Johnson has been our intern all summer long working with our young folks in conjunction with Madeline as well. They've done an awesome job working with our young people. Uh, we've got such a wonderful youth program and Ben's been leading that. And Johnson is going to come and talk to us tonight. So I want to encourage you to be back again tonight as he will uh, tell us a little bit about his summer and speak to us from God's word as well. We're in Luke chapter 6 this morning. I hope you have your Bibles with you because that's what we're going to be looking at. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, as we've been looking at the story of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, we've seen a number of different things. We've seen the calling of John the Baptist that God, before he's even going to be born, is going to call him to prepare the way for Jesus, and we've seen him doing that. We see Jesus as he's gone into the wilderness and faced temptation. We've seen him being raised. We've also looked at Jesus as he has started to perform great miracles. And those miracles have uh, declared to those around him that he is obviously going to be a person of power, a person from God, and it has brought their attention to him. We saw last week that because of that, Jesus has become so popular that really he's having a hard time being able to work with all the crowds that are coming for physical needs. But Jesus didn't come just to take care of temporary physical needs, just to heal people that were sick. He knew eventually they would die again. But if he could tell them about God's plan for their life, he came to bring them eternal life, not just a temporary fix. So at different times, he's going to go out into the wilderness. We saw last week that he chose 12 of his disciples to be close apostles there with him. And now Jesus is going to go about his main mission, which is to tell others about the kingdom of God. How did he do it? Well, he taught them. He taught them how to be disciples. See, to be a disciple is to be a follower and to say, look, this is what it's going to look like if you are following God. If you're going to be a child of God, this is what your life will look like. And I like the way that Luke does it. 
What we're going to be looking at in Luke chapter 6 is really a, a sort of a summary of a sermon that Jesus probably gave all over the place. See, every village he would go to, he would come and tell them the same thing. His teachings were going to be very similar. Now, on this one, it's going to be different. Luke it gives us all kinds of details many times. But if you wanted the most detailed version of this sermon, you would go to Matthew and you would read Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, the one that we would call the Sermon on the Mount. That's where you get all of the teachings. But what Luke does is, Luke gives us this synopsis of all of those teachings. So he's going to say, look, here's sort of the, here's the Cliff Notes version of some of them. He's going to still cover a lot of information, but as Jesus went from place to place, this is what you would hear if you were listening to Jesus. I think that's an interesting thought for us today. As we think about being disciples, if Jesus came to Columbia today, what would he want to tell you? Well, that's what we're going to do today. We've got a lot of information. I'm not going to be able to go through in detail of everything. We're not going to back up and talk about every sentence that he said because as Jesus presented his message, that isn't what happened. We do that many times as we study it. We hear Jesus say a sentence, and then we'll back up, and we may talk for five minutes about the depth of what he said. But imagine if you were there and Jesus came, and he was going to present this to you. He just said it and moved on to the next one. He was just talking from verse to verse. So if we miss out on some things today, go back and look at it again and again because Jesus' teaching continues to reveal himself. As Jesus is doing this, we're in Luke chapter 6, verse 20. And I believe we see one of the things that Jesus wants to do. Jesus, as he starts this lesson, is he wants to change our perspective. How you look at things in the world is so very important. And as he comes and he's going to teach you, he says, look, the perspective you take is going to matter so much in what you do. It's, the perspective you take as you deal with suffering is going to matter on how you're going to respond. The perspective you take on temporary things versus eternal things. He wants to start at the very beginning and change the perspective. Well, let's look at how he does that. Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that's how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Well, as Jesus begins, he's changing the perspective, isn't he? Now, if you were looking at Matthew, you had the Beatitudes, and you would have nine of them here. Luke is only going to repeat four of those. But as you look at what Jesus was saying, he's setting the stage for them to say, look, I want you to really understand what a blessed life looks like. The idea of this blessed life, that God is looking, at, uh, looking down on you, and he's going to bless you in whatever way. I want to give you a perspective change on what blessing is looking like. But Jesus also says, but I also want to speak to some of you who are in bad shape. He's going to pronounce a woe on them. What's the idea of this woe? It's going to be that there's a distress. There's a sorrow that is coming into your life because your perspective is not the what it ought to be. And how does he do it? As he comes, he starts to talk about some facts, and really what we see here is they're, they're very opposite of what we're used to. They're opposite of what we commonly observe. He says, blessed are the poor, the hungry, those who weep, those who are hated, those who are excluded. He said, these are the individuals who are going to be blessed, even those that are insulted. When this is our lot in life, if that was where we were, if we were like, well, I'm poor and I'm hungry. People don't like me. People have excluded me. I'm no longer popular. People are insulting and make fun of me. That is not when we would think we're living the blessed life. But Jesus says, I want you to focus on the eternal things. And I want you to understand that really many of these things can be a blessing in your life. 
What's Jesus trying to do? He's trying to help them to focus, change their perspective. Look at what your Father in heaven is going to do when it comes to taking care of the needs that you have. Many times we don't look to the Lord until we have those needs. It's one of the flaws of mankind. It's not until we become poor or become sick or whenever we're facing hunger. That's when people say, you know what I need to see? I need to see what is really important. And that's when so many times people turn to God. And Jesus is saying, look, I want you to understand even the difficult things you're facing in life can be a blessing to you if they help you to be on the right track with your Father who's in heaven. He also is going to tell us, that, look, our Father in heaven is going to take care of you. God is going to take care of these needs regardless of whatever you're going through. And what's he doing? He's encouraging us to change our perspective, to view this world through eternal truths and not just the temporary, superficial things of this world. When we're poor, we realize we're in need. When we realize who God is, we realize that he's going to take care of our needs. When we're hungry for spiritual things, you know what's going to happen? God is going to be able to give you the needs that you have. God is going to satisfy you. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you have an opportunity through your Father to be filled. If we will focus our hunger on what God wants us to have. When we weep, when we have sadness, when we have sickness in this world we can realize that God has come to give us an opportunity to have joy anyways, to laugh and to rejoice in his deliverance. You're even blessed when it seems like everybody around you rejects you. We understand in our world today that what we believe, if we believe what the Bible teaches, we're going to be in sharp contrast to the world around us. When our young people go back to school here in a week or so, they're going to go to a place where so many things that you're going to be taught are not going to be in line with what God has said. When you stand up for what God has said within his word, you're going to be at odds within, with so many people in our culture. But what does Jesus say? He says, look, I want you to change your perspective. What did he say to do? Well, he says, don't, don't worry about what others are saying. He says, you're blessed when people hate you. When they exclude you, when they insult you, when they reject your name as evil because of the Son of God. He says, you know why? Here's the perspective I want you to see. He says, look back through all of Scripture, and as God sent his prophets, what did they do? They rejected him. What are they going to do with John the Baptist? Herod is going to cut off his head. What are they going to do with the Son? God they're going to take him and nail him to a cross whenever you start to feel pressure in this world and whenever you start to have others saying there's something wrong with you whenever they want to call you a hater because you want to follow what God's word says when they start to reject you because of your beliefs in Jesus Christ and what the word says he says what do you do understand the right perspective is you're now in a long line of people who God loved who did his will and the world rejected him. Why? Because so many people will reject God's place. And what do we have to understand? If we're going to be disciples, that will be our place in this world many, many times. Jesus then goes on to pronounce these woes, these, these signs of distress. Problems are coming to people that we think, that the world thinks so many times, are going to be blessed. People who believe their situation in this world is the determining factor of the quality of their lives, he says, they're going to be sadly mistaken. There was a lot of powerful, wealthy people there. As people came to listen to Jesus, we talked about that last week, as they got into that, uh, that room where all those individuals were there, the leaders were there. These were people that were highly esteemed, that everybody else spoke well of those individuals, and Jesus changes their perspective. What did he say? Woe to the rich. Woe to the well-fed. Woe to those who are laughing now. Woe to the ones who everybody's speaking well of you. If you have everything in this world going for you. He says so many of those individuals, he needed to say, watch out. There's a warning for you. Because when we have all the things going for us, and I believe the second list describes many of us here today, we're well fed. We're taken care of. Our needs are met. We've got a lot of things that can bring comfort in our world. But if we start to think because we have some money in the bank, because of the physical things that are going on, because a lot of people say, hey, that's a really good person. We listen to other people's standard of righteousness. What's going to happen? Jesus says it's very easy to start relying on ourselves. 
It's very easy to realize that we are trusting in something that ultimately we're not in control of this world and it can make us fail to trust in our Father who's in heaven. If you have everything in this world going for you and that leads you to fail, leads you to fail to see your need for the Lord, for his deliverance, for his guidance, for his teachings, then you're going to be in a difficult shape in life. Why? Because your perspective will be warped. Ultimately, what does he say? If you have all these things and you don't see the Father, then you're poor. You're starving. You're going to be weeping. You're in a long line of people who said, you know what? The temporary things of the world are going to determine what is right. So Jesus changes perspective. He then goes on after this perspective change says, now I've got some things I want you to do. I've got some commands for you. Jesus, if he's going to say, I want you to follow me, well, I need to tell you what I need to do. I need you to tell me exactly what it's going to look like. What does a disciple look like when it comes to the words of Jesus? Look at what he says in verse 27. He says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, don't withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks of you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Imagine Jesus sharing those words with us. There'd be a lot of questions that could come up, wouldn't there? There's a lot of things that look, okay, my perspective has been changed. I'm trying to think about eternal things and not worry about temporary things. But now it really comes where, oh, this is what that looks like. All the standards of what we would do with others when they mistreat us. All the things that when somebody does this wrong, how I feel, how I'm supposed to respond is going to be totally different than what I am feeling. Instead, if I'm gonna follow Jesus, I'm gonna change my reaction to those around me. And what does he want me to do? He wants me to love others. Jesus' command for his followers is that you love those who are around you. To what extent? I want you to even love those that are unlovable. Love those that aren't doing anything to be deserving of your love. Bless people who are cursing you. Suffer injustice and don't worry about striking back. Be more willing to give than you are willing to try to say, I need what I deserve and I'm going to try to keep something for myself. Give to everybody that you can. Don't be obsessed with your things. Be obsessed with your care for others. To the extent that you would do to others as you would want them to do to you. Jesus, when he comes with his teaching, he says, look, you want to be one of my disciples. He's calling us to a high calling, isn't he? He's calling us. And you can imagine all the people, our toes are getting stepped on because he's saying, look, it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. You be in control. Actually, even more than that, you don't be in control. You give control to your reactions to others, especially those that don't like you. You hand those over to God and you let Others see what God is doing through your life because you're going to care for them. Why is that important? Verse 32, look what he says. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But you, but you love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Jesus is given a high calling. If you went back to Matthew chapter 5, you see where he's going to tell everybody, you're the salt of the earth. 
You're the light of the world. You're the city that's set on a hill and it can't be hidden. Well, here he says, look, this is how it's going to look. Like, how are people going to notice how different you are? When you put salt into something, that whole dish is totally different. Whenever you add light to something, now everything's illuminated and you see it. A city that's set on a hill, everybody knows when somebody's a disciple of Jesus Christ. And here within these commands, he says, this is how you're going to show up. This is how people are going to say she is totally different than everybody else. This is how people are going to understand when I see this individual, he is different than everyone else. Why? Because of the depth of his love. You lend and you don't even worry about whether or not somebody pays you back. You love your enemies. We live in a world that is just festering with division and everybody's trying to divide everyone else, pick your sides, and then what do you do? Once you see somebody on the other side, on the wrong side of an issue, a wrong side of a situation, then you hate them and you despise them and you strike out at them. But what does Jesus say? It's okay when somebody disagrees with you. You love them anyways. You care for them anyways. You look at those that disagree with you and you do the one thing that could bring them back to where God would want them to be. And that's to love them. Jesus is given these commands and he's given this high calling, but he's saying, look, be loving with those who don't agree with you. Everybody's not ever going to agree with you. Well, how are you going to handle it when there are differences? They don't agree with Jesus. Well, what do you want to do? You want to be good to them. You want to show them that you're different than the rest of the world. And when they start wondering why, you say it's only because of what Jesus has done in my life. I don't do what I feel like doing every time. I don't say what I feel like saying in every situation. Why? Because I'm letting my Savior, my Lord and Savior, control my actions. And he can help you as well. What does he want? He wants us to be like our Father who's in heaven. Do good to others. Take care of them. Be merciful. Why? Because that's what our perfect Father does for us. And if we're going to say that we're the children of God, if we're going to want the inheritance from our Father, what is He calling us to do? He's calling us to go out and act like God does with the rest of the world. He looks at a world that has chosen to sin. He looks at a world that says, I don't care anything about God, and He loves them enough to send His only Son. Jesus see, receives the insults from others, but he doesn't insult them back. Jesus doesn't deserve the punishment, but he takes it because others deserved it, because we deserved it. And what does God call us to do? Jesus gives some commands. Once your perspective has changed, you're going to live different, and you're going to start looking to take care of other people. You're to love, kill others with kindness, be gracious to everyone, be merciful when others make mistakes, be forgiving. Why? Because that's what God does for us. Do to others as you'd want them to do to you. Love abundantly. Be merciful like your Father in heaven, and that's going to make you be seen to be his children. Jesus carries on next with some warnings. As he teaches, he says, look, I, I want to warn you against some things that are so easy to do in life. We're challenged to go above and beyond in every way to be just like our Father in heaven, but another huge challenge is presented. He's calling us to share in the holiness of our Father, and he also calls us to be forgiving and to be understanding to those who fail to meet his standard. See, Jesus has changed our perspective, and then he's given us all these different teachings, and we've seen what he wants, and we're doing everything we can to obey these commands, to be a disciple, to do what Jesus wants us to do, but then you're going to be confronted with people who aren't doing it at all, who aren't making the right decisions, who are failing to see that, who aren't being the disciples they need to be. And he says, look, when you start to interact with them, I want you to be careful in what you do as well. Look at what he says in verse 37. Jesus tells us, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus has given us some pretty big warnings, some things not to do. We're not to judge. We're not to condemn. We're to forgive other people. We are to make sure that we're giving. And he's saying, look, do all these different things. Now, many times people will take these and they'll 
take them out of context in a way that says, oh, well, you know, if you don't make any decisions about anyone else, then no decision will be made about you. And that's not true. Scripture tells us everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God. Everyone is going to sit there and either have God say, you well done, or depart from me. That's going to be the end result. What's Jesus trying to say when he says, don't judge and don't condemn? How do you view others that haven't figured it out yet? How do you deal with others who are strained from what their father wants them to do? We want to make sure that as we deal with others, we give them the benefit of the doubt. Whenever we're dealing with others, we don't want to judge others harshly. We don't want to look that in our lives, the way we're going to be described is that that person is judgmental. A follower of Jesus doesn't seek to find somebody so that they can condemn them. That's not what their life is about. Our our first impulse, as Jesus is teaching here, is we're looking for an opportunity to forgive the failings of others to see what we can do to give to them, to try to help them in a way to get where they need to be. Whenever you give others the benefit of the doubt, whenever you decide to not judge other people harshly or be judgmental, what you're going to do is you're going to sit there and deal with them through their problems because ultimately what do we want them to do? We want to draw them into such a situation that they can move past their problems. But do you ever want to listen to somebody who's being judgmental towards you? Is it very effective when somebody else condemns you and points out every flaw that you have in such a way? Is that what you're wanting? Is that an effective way to draw people to you? Now, Jesus has his teachings. Jesus has just said a lot of stuff that shows we're not in line where we ought to be, hadn't he? Do you love your enemies the way that you ought to? Do you give to people and expect nothing back? How many of the things that Jesus has already said would condemn you if you said, look, have you got everything down here perfectly? And as you see what he teaches, like, I don't have all these things. I've got a lot to work on. He says, now, when you deal with other people, see, their flaws bother us. Our flaws, we just look right past them. So as we deal with others, how do we need to interact? Not in a judging and condemning way. Jesus is going to tell us in John chapter 4 that the words that he has spoken is going to judge everyone. We know who's going to judge. God will absolutely judge based on his word. We can leave that to him, but as we interact with others, we want to be forgiving. We want to be giving. Why? Because we have been given the hard work of looking for, caring for others, and trying to draw them closer to God, and we have to be smart as we do that. But he then goes on to say, look, As you do this, you need to make some wise decisions, though. What's another warning? Look in verse 39. He gives us now a warning that as you deal with others, you want to be forgiving and you want to be giving, but you've got to be wise because if you get with the wrong person who's doing the wrong thing, you can be dragged down with them. The way Jesus says it is this. He told them this parable, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? If a blind person is grabbing the hand of somebody and says, come and follow me, and the second person is blind, and he has no idea that the person that's leading them can't see anything, what's going to happen? They're going to fall right in the ditch. And he says, as we go about trying to be a disciple, we've got to sit there, and we've got to make sure that the people that we're following are telling us what Jesus would say, not what they feel or what they think. Are they telling us what God has taught us? Otherwise, you're going to get off course. He says, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take a speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck that's in your brother's eye. Well, what are the two simple warnings for us? Watch out who you're following. Who you spend time with is going to have an effect on what you believe. Watch who you're letting teach you. Make sure that they're going to God's Word, because otherwise, if they're just telling you what they see in this world, they may not see what God sees. So watch who you allow to teach you. The second warning is what? Be self-aware of your own problems. As we come together, I hope that there's no one in here that believes they're perfect. 
I hope there's nobody here that says, look, I've, I've taken care of my issues. Everything is right. Because that's the farthest from the fact, isn't it? Jesus says, look, you're going to go to help somebody. And in the situation, he's using comedy. He says, you've got a little speck of dirt in your eye. And this guy walks up and he's got a two by four sticking out of his face. I mean, I mean the, the, someone else has a speck and you have a two by four coming out of your face. What's he saying? You're going to come and try to help somebody with a little speck when you have this huge thing coming out of your face. Well, what does he say? Look, being a disciple of Jesus, just live and let live. Leave them alone. It doesn't matter if they have a speck, leave them alone. That isn't what he says, is it? He says, be self-aware. If I've got all of these big problems in my life, I need to address my issues. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ isn't about being perfect, but it is about trying to be in such a way that you're allowing God to perfect your life. When I've been lying and I read what Jesus says, I quit lying. When I've been greedy and I read what Jesus says, that I'm going to quit chasing money like I have in the past. When I've been given into lust and I read what Jesus says, that I'm going to start getting away from lustful situations in my life. I'm going to clear this stuff out of my life. So then what am I called on to do? I'm going to be self-aware, get these problems out of my life so I can help the person next to me. And I'm going to help them in a way that's not judgmental and condemning, but I'm going to help them in a way that will allow them I'm going to try to walk to them and say, look, I've been working on this too. Can I help you to get this out of your life? Because that would enable us to help others without being a hypocrite. No one wants to be helped by a hypocrite. Last thing that Jesus would say here, I've just got this sort of listed when it comes to help. You've got this perspective. You have this command. You see warnings. And now he gives some closing advice. He says, here's some advice on how you can identify those who are blind who would lead you into a ditch. And this is very important today. There's all kinds of people out there that will talk about Jesus all day long. They will share some thoughts about verses just like Satan did when he was tempting Jesus. They shared some verses, but how am I going to be able to identify them? Look at verse 43. No good tree bears bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People don't pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What does Jesus tell us? As we start looking at other people, we need to realize that what we do in life is going to be shown to other people. It's as clear as walking up to an apple tree and seeing the apples. It's as clear as coming up to an orange tree and it's covered in oranges. When you come up to a pear tree, you know if that tree is in exactly what it is based on what you see on the outside. And he says, look, we need to pay attention to what is happening in people's lives. Specifically, he says, watch out for what is going on in their heart. And watch out for what's going on in your heart as well, because our heart will determine our conversations. You're going to have to listen very carefully to those who are leading you. The condition of your heart is going to show up in what you do. Watch other people's lives, not their public persona, not just the show that they put on, but what they're doing in everyday decisions. A person's heart will be seen in their interactions. As we think about ourselves this morning, Jesus tells us that you can tell as you look in the mirror whether you're a good fruit or not by looking at what you're doing. How's your personal interactions with your family? How do you interact with those who are your enemies or consider you an enemy? How do you interact with people at school? How are you going to interact with people on the ball team? How do you interact when you're in the middle of sports, when you're in the middle of a business dealing? How do you interact? How are you dealing with others? So we have to look at our lives carefully as we look at Jesus' teaching because he says what's happening in our hearts shows up in our lives. What's showing up in our lives is ultimately going to be the fruit of what is going on, and we have to look at ourselves carefully. If you have a problem with people within your family, at your job, with your neighbor, with your friends, with your family, if everywhere you go there's problems with other people, maybe it's that there's problems with you. And what's Jesus come to do? He's come to help us all with our problems. He's come to help us see past 
how to deal with others, what's he already given. Change your perspective on how you deal with things in this world. When you change your perspective, a lot of those problems can go away. When you start to listen to his warnings, that's going to help you. When you start to see his commands and say, look, love other people. It's okay to be done wrong every now and then. It's not okay not to love and be forgiving of others. When you change those things, the fruit in your life will start to change as well. What are people seeing when they look at you? Because our actions, not our intentions, are ultimately what are going to define whether we're a good tree or not. Jesus got up and he taught this lesson and he went from town to town and he kept teaching everyone. And as he did, you could imagine the conversations that happened after he left. There are some people who said, that's not for me. Eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There are some people that Jesus would have left and said, nope, nope, I'm, you know, I've worked hard for this money. It's going to be about me. I'm not letting anybody take advantage of me. You know what? They hurt me too much. I'm not forgiving them. There were people that Jesus walked out from that village and they said, never mind. They turned around and went back to their house. But there were some people who said, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm sure there were some that thought, how in the world am I going to do that? That seems like too much. I know that what is going on in my life is so drastically different from that. And they were going to have to make a decision. Are you going to do the hard work that it takes to be a disciple? Are you going to trust God to change your life, to change your heart, to change what's going on in your mind and enable you to start being totally different? Do you aspire to be the person that somebody looks at and says, why in the world did she put up with that? Why, Why was he loving anyways? Are you willing to be the person somebody walks away from and they're like, I was trying to take advantage of that person and it's like they just let me do it. Are you going to be the person that's the salt, the light, the city that's set on a hill? And that's Jesus' invitation. He closes with what Bo read for us before the lesson began. He says, look, you're building your house. You're building your life. And there's wise Houses that are going to be built, and there's foolish people that are building houses. But if you will hear these words of mine and you decide to do them, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a house that doesn't matter what the storm's hitting it, it's going to stand. I'm going to give you a house that in the midst of pain, in the midst of insult, in the midst of rejection, it doesn't matter how popular you are, it doesn't matter if you're poor, it doesn't matter if you're hungry, it doesn't matter what hardships you're going on, you're going to have a house that is built that will be ready for any storm, and ultimately you're going to be in a house that will be invited on in to your eternal glory with your father why because you decided to be his children may we all be challenged by Jesus's teaching I hope that you'll go back and continue to look over this this week continue to look at it continue to accept it continue to identify in your life look at myself and say what do I need to change but maybe you're here this morning and you know right now that there's things that need to change and you want to do that we want to be a family that does that you can confess your struggles with us no one here is perfect No one here has it all right, but we're following a perfect Savior, and that invites you to come. If you want to repent of sins, come forward. Let us know. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We want to help you in whatever way we can. Or maybe you're ready now to say, look, it's a high calling, but I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's the greatest life you can ever live. Come believing in him. Confess his name. Be buried with him in the waters of baptism. We're ready to help you in any way we can. If we can help you, please come as we stand and as we sing. Hey!